Welcome to Overcome America Hair Loss Summit. My name is Valerie Fuentes. I'm your host. And today I am with Christine Mager Webbeck. She's the author of It's Only Hair, a humorous self book about living and coping with hair loss, and also the award winning novel Vacant Eyes. Thank you, Christine, so much for accepting my invitation. I'm so happy to have you here today. Thank you for having me. Of course. So first off, I wanted to talk to you about your alopecia journey. What was that like and when did it start? Um, well, I was, I was um, married and 23 and I noticed a little bald spot on the back of my head, probably about dime shaped, not very big, but it was just very smooth and I didn't know what it was. And then, um, I had my husband look and we discovered that I was missing hair and it just progressed from there and it became fairly profuse, not total hair loss, but I had lots of spots. And, um, and within a few months it grew back and then it happened again a couple of years later and we went and had it diagnosed and they did a, um, a biopsy and discovered it was alopecia. Mm -hmm. And um, I thought, well, that's, that's cool. This has got a name, so it must have a cure. <laughs> no, <Right. laughs> no, did not have a cure. And, um, and so we tried all kinds of treatments, you know, the Halog solution and um, different kinds of ointments and, and eventually tried the shots and the shots worked as long as the spots weren't too big or too um, profuse. And so um, Eventually, the shots quit working, and my hair seemed to um, grow in and fall out every couple years. It grew really well when I was pregnant, and then it would fall out after that. Um, but, you know, I couldn't keep having kids just to grow hair. So <laughs> I had um, eventually, um, it, it just all fell out after several years. Um, I think it was in 93. Um, I went through a really bad bout of depression and ended up in the hospital. And that's when my hair all fell out and then it never came back after that. I'd get little patches of fuzz, but really nothing that, that you could call hair, nothing you could comb over. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so um, that's kind of how it went. And um, honestly, I always thought that, um, having a little bit of hair was worse than having none because having none was just, you didn't have to find hair on your pillow. You didn't have to find hair on your clothes. You know, you didn't have to worry about it falling out in the shower and getting all over the walls and the floor. And, and it was just almost easier to not have any at all because it kind of erased that hope, you know, mm -hmm. was coming and it just helped me deal with it kind of just once and for all. It's like breaking up with someone, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you know, so yeah, definitely you, you kind of mourn the loss of your hair because you are losing something. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's like an appendage. It's like a part of you. And mm -hmm. so it's, it's just easier to not have that little bit of hope or to not have that sense of, um, well, I have a little bit of hair and maybe it'll come back and maybe I can comb it just so-and-so and, and that's, it was just almost easier to not have any, just to not have to deal with it. Yeah, it's definitely a roller coaster. Mm -hmm. And it's so funny you mentioned that uh, about being pregnant because that I don't have children yet, but I am married. And every time I think about getting pregnant, I think, am I going to lose all my hair? Because people tell me that you usually tend to lose hair, but I've also heard what you're telling me. So I guess it's the lottery and that knows what I'm going to get. <laughs> yep. I, I wondered, you know, if well, like I kind of equated it to stressors in my life. Those were times when I would lose my hair, like when I was in the hospital, um, when I was in the hospital for my uh, depression, that's when it all fell out. Um, mm -hmm. But when I was pregnant, I was, I always enjoyed being pregnant. I, I, it was exciting for me. So maybe, and I know that hormones do play a big role in right. um, helping grow hair. So I know for some people that might've been the opposite, but um, I, I really do think that being pregnant would, would help, would benefit. And maybe it was the vitamins, maybe it's the hormones, who knows. Right. But, and so 
when did you start wearing hair? When did you decide, okay, I'm done. I'm just gonna wear a wig. Um, let's see, that was probably in the late 80s, early 90s, because then, by then, every time my hair would fall out, every couple of years, um, when it would fall out, it would get, I would lose even more of it. I'd lose it on other parts of my body, like my calves or my thighs or my arms or, or whatever. And, um, and by that point, my hair had gotten so thin on my head that it was, um, it, it, I really needed a wig. Um, and I, I bought, I bought a couple from, um, like wig stores, beauty salons. I bought a couple through magazines, but they were, they looked very wiggy, you know, the wefted type, uh, with the elastic bands in it and, um, they're adjustable and, um, those kind of wigs, that's what I would order. And they just never looked very natural and they were mm -hmm. itchy and they'd move around on my head. So that was, you know, I still had hair at that time, but really not enough to be comfortable going out without a wig or something on my head. Mm -hmm. So um, I wore a wig and it was mostly for church and um, dressy occasions, weddings or, or whatever. But um, I worked at a hardware store and never wore my wig there. I just wore a ball cap. Mm -hmm. And everybody who knew me knew that I didn't have hair. And it was just easier and much more comfortable. Plus, you know, if my, if my hat blew off, people already knew I didn't have hair. It wasn't near as embarrassing as having your wig blow off, which has happened to me. <laughs> so, yeah. Wow. Um, yeah. So I, I, I only wore wigs when I absolutely had to. Um, but then when I discovered that they had vacuum wigs, um, they're actually hair prosthesis, then I ordered uh, one of those. And that really made the difference between caring and not caring about being bald. So tell me about that because I don't, I don't wear wigs. I, mm -hmm. This is not a wig. So what does that look like? What's the difference between the well, vacuum? vacuum wig is really made to fit your own head. They scan your head. The very first one that I got was like a fiberglass base which was a little bit thicker and it was hard. It was stiff. It was like this hard ball that you kind of had to push onto your head and you burp the air out. And, um, and it was, it wasn't really uncomfortable, but you know, uh, as a person goes through the day, um, depending on how much salt they, they consume, you tend to get puffy, especially if it's hot out, you know how your rings get tight. That's what happened with the wig after a long day, if it was really hot, or if, um, if I had too much salty food, um, my wig would get tight and it, I could feel it around the edge. Um, and I had probably <clears throat> two or three of those hard base until I discovered that that company had sold to a different company um, who then made the, um, the wigs as a silicone base. So they're mm -hmm. actually like a, a prosthesis, like you'd see someone slip their leg into, you know, an artificial limb. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the silicone base is made to fit only my head. The first one, they, the very first vacuum wig I had, they, um, they actually um, made a, a plaster cast of my head and then they took that off and that's what they made the wig from. But um, the, the silicone wigs that I wear now, the silicone base, they uh, actually scan your head, kind of like a UPC scanner at the grocery store, <laughs> you know, kind of like a wand like that. And they scan your head in every direction and it gives them a digital um, um, image of what your head is and the very um, exact replication of your head. And then they make the wig from that. And the, it's, it's a silicone base and then they inject the hair into it. So it's actually got like, no matter where you part your hair, it looks like. It's beautiful. Yeah. And then do you want to see it? Yeah. Yeah. I love that. It's, uh, it's rubbery. Wow. Silicone base. Okay. And then I could wad it up and stick it in my purse if I needed to. Okay. Um, and it's, it's very comfortable. And I can tell it's there. But it's not, um, it's not itchy. It, do, it does not come off. We have a convertible and I can put the top down and not oh, have to wow, break really? it off. Yeah. That's and awesome. It fits on by suction. And so 
as long as you get it on straight and then you push the air out, it does not go anywhere. So I can yank on it and it doesn't come off. You can swim in it. You can, you can shower. You can go boating or ride a roller coaster. Mm -hmm. Put your top down on your car and it won't blow off. Only wow. until you break the you break the suction. And since there are times when I don't get it on straight and I can feel a little bubble at the top of my head, mm -hmm. you just have to burp the air out, kind of like Tupperware. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and is this something that you could only wear because you don't have any hair, or if somebody has just a little bit, then then they have to shave it off. Okay, because right? it yeah. won't create the suction. If I had little patches of fuzz up here, it probably wouldn't bother, but it needs to have a smooth fit around the edges so that it, it has something to suck to. When I had my other one, um, it was a hard base, but um, I did have little patches of fuzz that would come in and you know get maybe an inch or two long. And they never really amounted to much. Um, after a while, I'd just shave it off, but it never seemed to affect the fit. Mm -hmm. So. But this one moves with my body. So if I do this, I can't, it just, it flexes, you know, so I, it doesn't dig in on the edges. It, it will expand. And I can actually scratch my head through my wig and feel like I've scratched my head. Really? The other one, the other one I'd have to take off if I had an itch. Right. Yeah. So yeah. I, I've never worn a wig. This is uh, kind of like a topper. Mm -hmm. My slides are the ones that are bad. Uh, mm -hmm. And so it looks very natural. Yeah. And I like that it's light and it's not, it's not heavy, mm -hmm. but what, like you said, the wind, I mean, forget about the wind. When I get wind, it's, it's over. <laughs> yeah. Everything's out. Um, but I love that because it covers your entire head. Mm -hmm. um, I just never had, I, <laughs> I just can... never tried it because I live in Miami. So oh, right. it would be really hot. Oh yeah. And it does get a little warm. I mean, there's a lot of hair because when they, when they, it takes like seven persons wigs to make one wig and I'm sure there's a lot of waste but the hair is pretty thick and you can now they've refined it so that you can get a, um, a light implant or medium or heavy if you had you know depending on what hair you had before and um, and they do a pretty good job but I did um, thin it after I after I got it so That's beautiful and so how long does it last is this something that you can have for years or do yes. you have well it depends on how much it depends on how much you wear it um i know people who who i know the ladies who sell these wigs mm -hmm. and um they wear them every day because they work full time and mm -hmm. they'll put it on in the morning and go to work and come home and take it off and um and so they have to wear it every day so it probably lasts i don't know three to five years for them mm -hmm. and and that's with significant that's time. you have to have it repaired. Um, and, and this one, I think I've had for three years. And so far, I haven't really seen much wear on it. And I probably wear it, I don't know, two or three times a week. So it wears pretty well. And I can, I can clip it up and with a, a hair clip or put it in a ponytail. You just kind of have to make sure that the edges and the back have a little bit of hair hanging down so you don't see this blunt right edge of hair you know so i love that because i can't wear my hair out this is my only hair to so. oh yeah that would be hard i think yeah yeah awesome so for the ladies that are in between not knowing do i want to wear a wig do i not want to wear a wig what will be your advice? Like, what should they do? How did you pick your first one? I don't know. And I actually, that question is for myself too, because <laughs> I've never had one before. So what will be the first step? And how did you make that decision? Um, what I well, would... You said you, you already lost your hair. So I think that was what motivated you to get one, right? Right, right. But if for somebody that's in between, mm -hmm. like when they go to the store, what should they ask? What should they look for? I would, you know, I, I would... I don't want to get in trouble for saying this, but if you're, if it's a temporary hair loss, I mean like someone going through chemo or something like that, um, then no, don't spend a lot of money on hair replacement um, because it, it's, it, it is kind of expensive, especially if you get human hair, which is what I have. Um, but um, if it's temporary, then look for, you know, 
um, online hair pieces and things like that. But most major cities would have uh, someone, a beauty salon or some kind of wig supplier. And I would suggest going there. If you're in the process of losing your hair um, through whatever uh, uh, trauma you're going through, I would suggest taking a little, um, a little tiny ponytail of your hair and keeping it. Just cut it off before you lose it and then keep that little, that little sprig of hair and take it with you to match up to a new wig um, so that you know you get the right texture, the right color, um, um, things like that. Um, go to a wig store and try on everything they have. If you're still losing your hair, there are so many different options. They have the kind of um, wig caps that you can clip on and actually pull your own hair through them so that your hair blends in. Um, sometimes they have just the little, just the little snapping band that you can actually add underneath your hair to make it look thicker and fuller or longer. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes they have like full hair pieces that you can still through pull through your own your own. So like with a natural wig that's wefted, you could pull through your own hair. But if you don't have any hair, then um, and the prospect of growing your hair is is minimal, then I would suggest looking for a vacuum wig because it, if you know it's going to be long term, um, you might as well be happy. So is this, is, this a, is this something that only one company is producing or is there different? I know. There, is, there are some, they don't do um, vacuum wigs, but there are some wig companies that do um, um, silicone base with human hair and very realistic looking but they're they're more um they're only silicone in certain areas not mm -hmm. complete silicone cap like this one this would be considered prosthesis the others would be considered hair pieces or wigs mm -hmm. um, because they have little sections of wefted um hair bands so that it's adjustable right. so that you could buy it off the shelf mm -hmm. Some of them you can get custom made too. I think that's just something you'd have to research. And right, and like kind of like try it out and see what you like, right? But I would recommend having people um, going to uh, a wig store and try on different styles, try on different, even different hair colors. There have been times when I've come home as a blonde or a redhead. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it makes it interesting for my husband, that's for sure. Yeah. Do you have a favorite? Um, that would be this one, probably because it's similar it's to my gorgeous. own. Thank you. Yeah. It's so beautiful. I love it. Um, okay, awesome. So tell me about your books. I know you are a writer. And mm -hmm. actually, part of the reason why I decided to reach out to you was because of your book, It's Only Hair. Right. Um, so when did you decide to write and share your story? Um, when I was in therapy for the depression that I went into the hospital for. And... Um, my therapist asked me, what's your plan? And I said, I don't have a plan. That's the beauty of it all. <laughs> and she said, you have to have a plan. Um, what have you always wanted to do with your life? That's basically she was asking. And I said, well, I've always wanted to be a writer. And she said, what's stopping you? And I, I just said, well, I, you know, I had all kinds of excuses and, and, you know, kids, marriage, all that. And then she finally said, you know, I said, well, I don't know what to write about. And she said, what about your hair loss? And then I realized that there were no books on how to deal with hair loss when I wrote mine. And so I took the next two years and um, wrote about all types of hair loss, not just alopecia, mm -hmm. because the common thread is the same. It's mm -hmm. with hair yeah. loss, whether it's male or female pattern baldness or chemo related hair loss or alopecia or trichotillomania or whatever is mm -hmm. causing hair loss the, the theme is still the same that we have to live with it we have to we have to learn to be okay with not um not having our own frame for our face you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um so i just decided to write the book and um it took me as i said two years and then i stuck it away in a drawer for 10 years <laughs> because I was afraid of rejection. And um, so I was uh, doing a children's sermon at church and it was all about using your gifts and not hiding them. 
and I felt very um, conflicted, <laughs> convicted maybe is the word. And, uh, and I thought I'm preaching to these kids about, about using their gifts and not hiding them. And I had a book at home in a drawer. So I wrote to a publisher that a friend of mine had told me about. And, and within a few weeks, they said, yeah, we'd, we'd be interested in publishing your book. And so um, they kind of helped me get the ball rolling. And, and in 2009, it finally came out. And from that experience, then I um, finally felt like I had the nerve to write the, the novel that I'd always wanted to write. So that's kind of how I got into the writing world. And, and my It's Only Hair book was probably my best therapy. Oh, I'm sure. sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, because for me, when I started um, finally speaking about my alopecia, it just felt like a weight got lifted on my shoulders. Like I didn't have to hide um, that I could actually have conversations with people without thinking, either looking at my head, can they notice, can they tell? Um, because I used to have a conversation, but I was never present. I was always thinking, are they looking? Can they see it? Right. Can they notice? And then if I, if I saw that they were staring, I would change the subject. So my conversations were always scattered. Right. Um, and it wasn't until I started speaking about it that, I don't know, I started feeling myself, I guess. Mm -hmm. Because you don't even realize how much is actually affecting you. Right, because we we, we don't talk about it, but just because we don't talk about it doesn't mean that you're not thinking about it or that right. like you're you're having those thoughts mm -hmm. um, that are influencing all your behaviors too. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I I can't imagine how that felt for you to write that book. It did, and 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 it was really um, helpful. And actually, like I sent the book to um, a local um, journalist, a news broadcaster who was going through cancer treatments and I just happened to send her the book and I thought, you know, maybe she'll get something out of it. And from that came news stories and, and um, uh, it was in the newspaper and book signings and things like that, that just kind of took off by itself. But mm -hmm. it really did feel like I had a purpose, you know, yeah. just being able to help someone else to be able to um, say that maybe this happened for a reason you know, um, I, I'm not the kind of person who, who immediately assigns purpose to bad things that happen because, mm -hmm. because I don't think, um, I don't think God causes bad things to happen or mm -hmm. even allows them. I think that things just happen and we have to decide whether to embrace it and how to deal with it. Mm -hmm. And my embracing my hair loss was being able to help other people with mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so it's funny that you said that you felt when you were doing the, the kids camp and you were telling them, to, you said that you were telling them to write, but you were not, oh, to show your gifts, to show right. their gifts, but you, they were, you were not doing yours. What happened to me was um, I've been a coach for a while now, um, like seven years, but I've been coaching executives and, um, I was coaching this woman and I'm telling her that she needs to connect with herself, um, you know, be authentic and just don't care about what other people think of her. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, just truly live her truth because I felt like she was in a shell and that the moment she got to be herself and, and open up things were shit for her. So I got done with the conversation that I'm thinking to myself, how dare you? <laughs> how dare you say that when you are not doing that? Um, and so it made me feel really inauthentic. Um, and I don't, now I, I get to say that I, that I'm choosing to wear hair. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the beginning I bought it so I would hide. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a big difference is, um, are you wearing hair because you're hiding your hair loss and you're just hiding period period, or are you buying your hair because it's your choice and that's the life that you want to live? Is right. this what's making you happy? Right. Mm -hmm. Right. 
Right. And so um, I actually got to experience that um, right before New Year's. I decided to to take off the smart part. This is called a smart part um, for like a weekend. Mm -hmm. And the first day was amazing. I felt so great to just touch my head like my full head like mm -hmm. I remember telling my husband like please touch my head like you never touch my head because also you know we get so sensitive right we never touch your head you, not only why are you not why are you touching my head but why are you yeah. not touching my head right yeah You're not so. touching it because of this or is he touching it because of that or what's he thinking yeah and we just analyze ourselves right out of the mood yeah and so um so first day was great second day you know, because I did it, so I took it off at the salon, and so they, they fixed it, and she curled it, and, you know, the little hair that I have, so it looked cute, but then the next day, obviously, the three hairs that I have, they're your sleep. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Scary times. So, when I woke up, I, 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 yeah, no, that was not a good image, and so I really got connected, though, to why I decided to wear hair. Right, because I did not want to deal with that. I did not want mm -hmm. to spend two hours of my day in the mirror trying to make it look a little better because it's not going to look good enough for what I want to, you know, for to feel comfortable. I guess right. not right. good enough because there's not good or bad, but it wasn't good to be to feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. um, and and I work out every day, so imagine sweating with that little bit of hair and then trying to have to style it. And oh my god, no. Oh well, yeah. So I decided, you know what, this is doesn't work. And he it, that's when I really got that it was a choice. It was it's really my choice to wear hair and I enjoy it and I like it and I love being able to leave my house like this and right. not have to worry about all the things and the styling and the color and the pigment and Yeah. So really we just want to feel good about ourselves. Yeah. You know, and however that is, I mean, some women are okay with not wearing anything on their head and still feeling confident and still feeling beautiful. And I'm not one of those people. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I like the way I look in my hair. I like the way it feels on my back and on my neck. And, and I like how it frames my face. It gives my makeup a stopping point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it, yeah, I just, um, there's nothing wrong with wearing a wig. On the other hand, I'm not afraid or ashamed to take it off when I'm doing a talk and show people who I am underneath my hair or to, to demonstrate. I can take my hair off and it doesn't kill me. It won't right. hurt me. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that's okay too. You know, I think we all just have to decide what we are comfortable with and everyone else is going to have to be comfortable with that as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And so I want to know, so the, the purpose of this summit uh, was to bring tools and resources to people that are going through this. And most important for me, I wanted to highlight the good things that has brought or could bring to your life. Mm -hmm. you know, good things that it has brought to my life and what it can, it can bring to your life because the, way I look at it right now is I am who I am because of alopecia. Mm -hmm. I am who I am because I lost my hair and that forced me to grow, to do soul searching, to figure out what I wanted to do with my life, to figure out who I am because I had it's to really separate good. myself from my body, right? right? Like I realized that I'm not my body. Right. Um, so what has been like the biggest lesson for you? What has been like yeah, the main lesson or the main good thing that this has brought into your life? Um, I think that if it hadn't been for, well, I, I really do think I would have still been dealing with depression, um, whether I had lost my hair or not. I know um, I would have been dealing with that because of my ex-husband and um, certain traumatic things that have happened in my past. But um, But I think that once I decided that I was, I was intelligent enough to write a book and to really um, be confident enough to pursue my dream um, of writing, um, that my hair loss kind of uh, 
helped implement that. My hair loss kind of, kind of pushed me off that diving board and made me do something that was a little bit scary. And um, I, I didn't know how to use a computer. And, and I, I, I was like, I don't, I don't have the first idea what to do and just little baby steps. And so having hair loss and living with that day to day and not worrying about what comes next, just worrying about today and not worrying about what comes next, that has probably taught me more than anything else. Um, because as anyone dealing with hair loss knows, especially with alopecia, it's very unpredictable. It's not one of these uh, conditions that you can say, oh, you're going to lose your hair and it will never come back. Or it, you're just going to lose a few spots and then it will come back. It's not like that at all. It's different for everybody, it seems. And uh, there are no guarantees. And so the best thing I think I've learned is just to get through today. I just told myself, get through today. Today you're okay. We don't have to worry about tomorrow. And it really helped me in dealing with a lot of different stresses in my life, including writing, because I think, oh gosh, you know, uh, once I'm done with this book, then what? I don't know how to market. I don't know how to to edit. I don't know. I don't know anything about that. And then I just thought, well, I'll just write the book first. So um, you just write the book. You just live the day. And as my husband always says, he's a pilot, um, a private pilot. He says, you fly the plane. That is the first rule of piloting is just fly the plane. Mm -hmm. Don't panic. Just take care of what needs to be taken care of. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's kind of like that. Um, just getting through the day, learning what you need to learn to get through the day, to get to the next step. Um, when I'm writing, it's um, okay. I don't know anything about characterization or suspense. So I bought a book and I read all about it. I went to writers conferences. I learned how to market. I learned how to, how to um, publish. I learned all of that. And it was just one day at a time. Mm -hmm. It wasn't anything that I had to absorb or worry about tomorrow. It was just what I need today. That's what I do. So if hair loss taught me anything, it's taught me to be patient. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely a roller coaster. I also had, um, have had opportunities where, like you said, you see your hair coming back. And it's, it's such a teaser to mm -hmm. see that. And it's like, oh my God, I'm healing myself. And, and then next thing you know, it's, it's gone. gone again. And who knows what causes it yeah. to come in or to fall out. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. yeah, it's very unpredictable. Well, Christine, thank you so much for being with us today. I think that, I mean, I love your story and I resonate with you so much. I want to know what's next for you. Is there another book? Where can yes. we find you? Yes. I what's just finished my second novel. It's called Borrowed Memories and it's a paranormal mystery. Um, the second in the series after Vacant Eyes. And, um, and after that is published, then I'll be working on a book about South Dakota's cold cases, oh, which wow. is nonfiction. And then actually there'll be two of those. So that's what I'm doing next. And, and really my baldness or my hair has very little to do with my future plans. And that's the way it should be. Yes. I love that. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so yeah, if you guys uh, want to, please, I actually highly recommend to get Christine's first book. Uh, it's fun. Um, so they can find it on Amazon, right? Right. All my Is books. Is that the only good. place or? or um, Amazon and Barnes and Noble. Mm -hmm. All right, Christine. Well, thank you so much. And yeah. I'll get to see you again. All right. Thank you very much, Valerie.